Take out your smartphones, your cell phones, whatever portable device you have on your person, raise it high. How many of you, first thing this morning, before you even got out of bed, checked this thing for email, for Facebook posts, for text messages? Raise them high, raise them high. Isn't that wild? How many of you have your phone on the nightstand when you go to sleep at night, on the nightstand? Almost the same number of hands. How many of you actually sleep with the phone in the same bed? <laughs> yeah. When did our behavior suddenly change so dramatically? When did you start sleeping with your personal mobile device? When did you start taking it to the restroom with you, right? Do you remember the day, the month, the week, the year? Suddenly one morning you woke up and your behavior had changed. Simultaneously, so the invisible behaviors that we have are being somehow revealed, but at the same time, what else is being revealed to us? The behavior of the machine. So what I want to try to do with you today is to help you understand how in your businesses, as well as in your lives, how you can better understand how to leverage this incredible asset called behavior. Our behaviors and the behaviors of these machines. And I will bring you to places that are very uncomfortable. I will talk about machines in ways that you don't want to talk about them. But what I hope to do is to give you a sense for why it's important for us to embrace this new normal, how to enter this future with optimism rather with the gloom and the doom and the pessimism that so often we surround ourselves with. And there's, need, you know, there's, there's fear, there's reason for fear. I get that, I understand it, I value my privacy as well. We should have legislation around privacy, all of that I get. But we're building these digital selves that will have incredible value. And yes, we're giving away so much of who we are in doing that. But what we don't see yet, we see the fear, right? We see the terror. We see the reasons not to do it. We see the downside, but we don't yet see the upside. So your digital self is the single most valuable asset that humanity has created. There's one problem with your digital self. You don't own it. I don't own my digital self. It's owned by myriad other players, social media players, technology players. Somewhere in all this, I need to have an interest in that digital self. Be honest with me. How many of you are stuck in the past? You wake up in the morning and you say, damn it, I am stuck in the past again. How many of you? No one, right? Mm. But what if I were to tell you that we all behave as though we were stuck in the past? Hold that thought. Hold that thought for a minute. I want you to look at these ads. Think to yourself, you what, year, what year did these uh, uh, series of, of ads called the You Will Campaign by AT&T, what year were these broadcast, did these air? When do you think it was? Pressing it, right? Because you saw GPS right there. This AT&T knew exactly, when these things aired, they knew exactly what 2018 would look like. I mean, they hit the nail square on the head. Tablet computing. They called it sending a fax from the beach. Don't you love that? Right? Using the language of the past to describe the future. Uh, you're going to see WebEx here in a minute. What year was it? What year did AT&T air these ads? 88, someone said. 83, someone said. Yeah, believe it or not, it was 1993. 1993. They knew exactly what today would look like. Netflix. Prescient? So here's the question I have for you. Anyone from AT&T in the room? Good, because they don't like this question when it gets asked. How the hell could you predict the future so well and not capitalize on it? How does that happen? They, they understood the technology perfectly. They got it. There's an answer, by the way, because the answer AT&T will give you, if you talk to folks that were around at that point in time, that had the McKinsey's come in and help them understand what the future would look like. Their answer is, we knew it would be there, we just didn't think it would be this big. What makes that technology big isn't the technology. It's the behavior that we adapt and we form around that technology. That's what makes it big. For every major technology slash behavioral shift, there is a crisis of complexity. There is a trigger that happens right in the midst of that crisis, and you can't predict the trigger. It just happens. It's, all, it's almost a divine intervention of, of some sort. Then after the trigger, you have adoption. Sometimes the adoption is legislated. Sometimes it happens because it, it's a survival mechanism that we need in order to be able to continue to make progress as an enterprise, as individuals, as societies. There's a critical mass that you achieve and a new value axis. And this new value axis is critically important because the old value axis no longer applies. You throw that one out. So what does this look like? So let's take that AT&T example, right? So over time, technology begins to progress. So AT&T knows that there is a progression that will lead to telecommunications and to digitization and all the things that GPS, all the things that you saw up there. They understand that. They get the technology piece of it. 
The time between the introduction of that technology usually or its conception and the point of crisis and the trigger is usually somewhere in the 40 to 60 year range. Any idea why? And you can go back for the last 300 years and this number still applies. And if, in, in the book I use m multiple examples that we don't have time for here, but it's, I'm, I'm fascinated by the time period. You want to guess why it's 40 to 60 years? Generational. Until a lot of us die off, the stuff doesn't take hold. Because we, we're like blockers, we're like you know, a, 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 you know, a defensive line on a football team. We don't want to let that new behavior come through. Because the behavior is what? It's aberrant. Right? My kids are on the device 23 hours a day. That's aberrant behavior. They're being antisocial. Now forget the fact that they're actually on that device with 100,000 other kids at the same time, gaming, right? They're being antisocial, we say. Right? We're like the defensive line. We don't want to let that new behavior through because it's not the behavior we're accustomed to. And this is about behavior and how well we understand it and how well we can interpret it into technology. Speaking of which, one of my favorite examples of behavioral technology that was tremendously in in invasive, intrusive, uh, that revealed our privacy in ways that we never thought it would be revealed or wanted to be revealed. Anyone know who this guy is? Roger Easton. Anyone know what Roger did? He, he, he patented a device which every single person in this room has today, I can guarantee you. What did Roger Easton patent? 74 was it? Yeah, 1974. GPS. Roger began working on GPS in 1943. Hold that thought. Something happened 40 years after the day Roger began working on GPS that created the crisis and the trigger that ultimately led to the reason you and I have GPS today. Anybody? 1983, once again. Korean Airlines 007 shot down because he went into Soviet, supposedly into Soviet airspace by a Soviet fighter, killing all passengers on board. One of the people on board was a U.S. congressman, made big headlines. What did Reagan do as a result of 007 going down? He said, you know what? GPS is now available to private industry. It's no longer just available to the military. So the irony of that incident, I mean, the, the tragedy is immense here. A passenger plane does not have access to GPS and therefore strays into Soviet airspace, which will only, only be defined through GPS, which is only available to military. That is a crisis of complexity. Our, our tools are not keeping up with us. Our technology has exceeded our ability to adapt to it behaviorally. So what do we do? We change the behavior, which is why you all have GPS today. What is she doing? What is she doing? She's swiping, because to her, a magazine is a defective iPad, right? It should be intelligent. It should behave a certain way. You're not stuck in the past, are you? But you know people who are. You know people who aren't going to adopt <laughs> quite as readily as you and I might. Right? Have you ever told your kids where the term cut and paste really comes from? Right? Like, Whoa, really? You used to actually cut and paste? How cool is that? So we're seeing all these inflection points that are saying to us, you know what, the, the current models, they just don't work. The way we, we look at consumers, the way we, we think of, of, of the way we run our businesses and scale our businesses and our enterprises, the way we think of factories, the way we think of healthcare, education, none of these models really work. They worked really well. I'm not dismissing them. They are the models that got us to where we are today. They were marvelous, brilliant, but they won't keep working going forward. So the savior is, because this is what we all talk about, we have to have a savior. Artificial intelligence. Yeah, I, I don't like the term at all. I, I don't know how you feel about it. Um, I'll give you an alternative in just a few minutes, but something has to give. And at least AI causes us to think in terms that are uncomfortable, and when you're uncomfortable, you're more likely to come up with answers. Because that's when you learn, right? That's when you get educated, when you're really uncomfortable. So the societal discomfort we have today, I actually think is a very good thing. It is the educator that will, as a society, teach us what that next era should look like and what we need to do. But if you think about from 1800, which is what the horizontal axis shows here, to 2100, if you think about things like uh, population growth, which we just to talk about, and then plot GDP, global GDP, uh, and U.S. GDP, you see enormous increases. Things are actually getting better. And you've probably seen some of this. You've read about some of this. It's not all gloom and doom. Things are getting better. 
My point is not that, th that they aren't getting better and they won't continue to get incrementally better, but we need more than incremental improvement right now. Mark did that marvelous job of talking about the importance of thinking exponentially. So how do you do that, though? And I don't want to go through the math. How do you actually do that? How do you develop? And could we be at the precipice of developing a, a global population where poverty is pretty much eradicated? Right, where we have global health care, where we have universal services for all people on the planet. Because we have seven plus billion devices that we can use to talk to each other, but only about two and a half to three billion of us really have access to those devices on a regular basis. Right? So what, what does that world look like and how does AI create that world? If I could tell you I would be a brilliant person, I can't, so I'll rely on other brilliant people to tell you. And one of these people was Karl Popper, one of the great philosophers of the last century, of the 20th century. And what Carl said is, look, he said every problem is either a clock problem or a cloud problem. Clock problems are finite and solvable. Cloud problems never will be. I would submit to you that we are just now at that, that line of demarcation between the clock problems and the cloud problems. And your job, the, the most challenging aspect of your job, is to make that transition and to bring your organization with you.